It's now my turn to say good morning. Okay, good morning. <laughs> it's such a beautiful um, Sunday morning. Um, and unfortunately, a little bit warmer. As you know, I, I complain a lot about this, this terrible weather. Um, it's horrific. But it is a joy and a privilege for us to be able to gather in the presence of the Lord, to gather in fellowship with one another, and especially on a day like this. See, this, of course, as you know, is Remembrance Sunday. It's not just an ordinary day on, on our calendar. Um, it is a day that marks um, one of the greatest tragedies in human history. It marks a day where we remember millions of brave men and women who fought and died in the pursuit of justice, in the pursuit of freedom. And not only do we remember those who fought, but we also remember those who were victims of the fighting, those who were innocent. And it's a terrible thing for us to, to even imagine, to, to contemplate the atrocities that were committed. We live in a time where um, there is relative peace and stability in the world, and I use that term relative very lightly. But it is classified as one of the most peaceful times in human history, where we are today, as hard as it may be to believe. And of course, in remembering the past, we obviously cannot overlook what is going on now. Around the world, the atrocities that are still being committed. The fact that humans have been unable to learn from history. We face death all day long is what the Word tells us. We are like sheep being led to the slaughter. This is a reality of the world in which we live. And yet we have something to hold on to. And so before we get into our message this morning, as I have done in the past, so I want to remind you of what this day truly means. Um, an audio clip of the last moments of the Great War. Just listen to this. It's a stark reminder of what occurred on that day, 11th of November at 11 a.m. Bombs were still falling just moments before. Then there was silence. What I love about that clip is the fact that in that silence, you can hear birds singing. And I'm reminded of the Christian symbol of 
peace. The Christian symbol for the coming of the Holy Spirit, the one who grants to us strength in our moments of adversity, in our moments of pain, in our moments of suffering, the dove. I picture in in that moment listening to the, the silence that falls upon the land and that bird sing. Now, one of the reasons why I chose this particular passage for this morning, um, and of course with it being the day of remembrance, is the fact that when we look at this particular passage, there are two things that we see, two things that we can hold on to. Number one, it is the promise that God will return, that Christ will come down and he will take with him those who belong to him. And yet, as we hold on to this promise, we are reminded of the second thing, that death is a surety for each one of us. It's an uncomfortable topic for us to speak about. Let's be honest, none of us like speaking about death. None of us like thinking about death. But on this day, we remember the countless men and women who fell, those who have died. On this day, we don't just remember them, but we remember those who are still engaged in armed conflicts and wars around the world, who are dying for justice, those who are dying for peace, those who are dying in their their innocence at the hands of others. We remember those of our families, our friends, people who we have grown to love, who have gone before us. Because death is a reality. It is something we cannot escape. And when death rears its ugly little head in our lives, what do we do? For most of us, we pull back. We try to escape the reality. For some of us, we become angry, cursing death as if it was a a real person standing next to us. Sometimes we try to flee. Sometimes we, we panic. And we freeze. We don't know what to do. See, each one of us has faced death at some point in time. And each one of us will face it personally. But our question remains, is in the face of the tragedy, in the face of the adversity, in the face of the hardship and the reality that is death. What do we do? Where do we go? And where do we seek shelter and comfort? See, I love the way Paul is is describing death in this passage in line with our Christian hope in Christ Jesus. You see, in in the bustling city of of Thessalonica, by the way, it's a a seaport city that is known to have had about 200,000 people living there. And we know from descriptions that there were many people from all over the known world who would either be living there, people coming in to trade, to communicate. So you have this wide variety and mix of different people from different cultures speaking different languages, each of them with their own set of beliefs. And Paul is almost comparing the two in a beautiful and profound way 
when speaking about death. And in both instances, he's saying, we do not want you to be uninformed about the things that are still to come. See, that brings us to our first misconception, the first of two that Paul describes, the first being that misconception of the unbelievers, the pagan worshippers who were found in that city. Because when Paul describes them, he describes them as a people who grieve, who have no hope. Because in the pagan world, we are reminded that they have many weird and and to us very strange concepts about the reality of death and what happens to the individual after death. But that misconception basically boils down to the fact that they view death with a certain sense of horror. Because the the core of the belief is that when a person dies, that is it. You simply cease to exist. Now sometimes... We look at the world around us and we see this same thought, this same idea of what death is like. As if to say, there is nothing afterwards. Sometimes we as believers struggle with that same concept which is what Paul addresses with the second misconception. When he says to them, I do not want you to grieve like them who have no hope. See, in Thessalonica, the believers had this idea that with the coming of Christ, it would happen in their own lifetime. In other words, they would still be around when Christ returns. They did not understand fully what Paul was teaching. They did not understand fully what Jesus himself was speaking about. And of course, what happened was that the believers within the church in Thessalonica started to, some translations say, fall asleep. Our translation says, those who slept in death. And what happened? The church began to panic. Believers thought, well, what is going on? Surely Christ should have come by now. As believers, we weren't supposed to face the reality of death. He was going to come and take us to be where he is. And so they grieved as the world grieved. They faced a new sense of hopelessness because they didn't understand. Their idea was that those who had now died had missed their chance to be with Christ when He comes. And Paul, in addressing the reality of death, begins to encourage them, begins to offer them this sense of hope with a truth, not a misconception, not a fine-sounding idea, but a truth Surrounding the resurrection life. Nobody got excited about resurrection life. That's fine. We will get there. There we go. <laughs> oh, Dave. I love it. See, those who have fallen asleep have not missed their chance. 
Those who have fallen asleep have not missed the opportunity to come to God or to be in God's presence is what Paul is saying. In fact, Paul says in verse 15, I love these words, according to the Lord's word. Not according to my word. Not according to the words of the teachers who have come before me not according to the words of any of the other apostles who are teaching the Word of God. He says, according to the Lord's Word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. We will not precede those who have fallen asleep. I love this. And this, this doctrine, by the way, does not actually appear in, the, in any of the Gospels, actually. This is the first time that we see this, this concept of a rapture. You know, we view the rapture and we think it's going to be, you know, quiet. It's going to be, you know, people are just going to disappear from their seats there. I don't know if you've ever, anyone's ever watched that movie. It's a terrible movie. I wouldn't recommend watching it, but I, I watched it because I was like, what is this about? It's called Left Behind, and it's all about the rapture. And, you know, in, in a poof of smoke, all of a sudden people are disappearing off the face of the earth. And there are their clothes neatly folded where they stood. And there are people left behind. Hence the title. This is the first and only reference in Scripture to this concept of a rapture. And it is not going to be silent. We are told that there will be a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And it is in that moment where the dead will rise. And when they rise, those who are in Christ Jesus will be taken up to be where he is. See, death is, is not the end of life. It is the beginning of an eternity. So why, as believers, should we fear death? Why, as believers, should we grieve like the world grieves the, those who have no hope? See, I love these words, and I'm reminded here of Jesus' I am saying to Martha when he himself is facing the reality of death when his friend Lazarus dies. John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though he die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Is what Jesus asks her. See, that is the truth of the resurrection life. Neither Jesus nor Paul at any point in time said, as a believer, you will be exempt from facing a physical death. It will come. But he is saying that as believers in the risen Christ, the one who is the resurrection, the one who is the life, we do not have to struggle through that reality. We do not have to fear death, nor do we have to concern ourselves with the worries of the world when death rears its face. Because we have the promise from the one who is the resurrection that you and I will be taken up to be with him. I want to say again, we do not have to fear death. 
Because we are in Christ Jesus, the one who conquered death, the one who has victory over death. And because we are in him, because we put our faith, our hope, and our trust in the risen Christ, we share in that same victory. Yes. Yes. Paul doesn't just leave it there. Because if we truly are going to be honest with ourselves, it's easy to stand here and say to you that you shouldn't fear it, that you shouldn't worry about it. And it's easy, I think, for for you to go out from this church this morning and go to a friend, a colleague, somebody who is close to you, somebody who may be suffering, somebody who's going through the pain and the reality of death and say to them, don't worry about it. Take heart. Be of good courage because we don't have to worry about death. As human beings, death is painful. We understand that. Jesus understood that. When he demonstrated his own humanity as he wept for Lazarus. See, I want to say that, yes, we don't have to fear it. We don't have to worry about it. But at the end of the day, because we are human, it is part of who we are. And so Paul goes on with these beautiful words. In verse 18, he says, Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Words. He's not he's not saying that just write it off, pull yourself towards yourself, get over it. He's saying, I understand the reality. I understand the pain that comes in these moments. But encourage one another with the truth of of the resurrection life. Encourage one another in the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Encourage one another with the reality that eternal life is promised to you and to me who believe in Jesus. So be encouraged this morning and hold on to the truth of God's Word, the hope that we find in Jesus. And be of good courage. Let us pray. Almighty, loving and everlasting God, We praise you, Lord, for the gift of your word to us. We praise you, Lord, for the gift of your Son, Jesus. We praise you, Lord, for the gift of the promise of eternal life with you. And yet, Lord, as we face the realities of this world, as we grieve for those who have gone before us, and as we stand in remembrance of those who fought for justice, we are assured, Lord, that they will not, that we will not precede them. For they are still your children, Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of eternal life. Life that is not earned. Life that is not deserved. But life that is given because you love us. And so, Lord, we pray that as we face the realities of death, 
and as we face the ongoing struggles in this world, remind us that you are with us. Renew us. Strengthen us, Lord. And encourage us daily with your Holy Spirit as we look to you, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray.